Today, we're going to be looking at a passage not from uh, the words of Jesus, but from the book of Proverbs. Because the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom, okay? It's not a book of formulas, okay? Do you understand what I mean? I, I took chemistry. I don't remember much, but I do know when you do chemistry, you, you add this at this temperature to this ingredient, do this, do that, and you always get a certain result, right? Hopefully. Uh, and if you don't, you look back at your methods and go like, yeah, something went wrong there, <clears throat> right? High school chemistry. How many of you have had chemistry? Yeah. Our high school in Michigan didn't have um, hood vents in the lab. Can you believe it? I think they probably do now. But back then, in organic chem, we were doing things like with toluene and other things. And oh my gosh, the fumes, we'd get high just in chemistry class. Anyways, that's beside the point. But the point is, the book is not a book of formulas, of equations with guaranteed results. A lot of people try to treat Proverbs that way. It rather is a way of wisdom in general. Kind of rules of thumb, you've heard that phrase before. Um, when you live in this created world and you live according to God's design in this world, typically, often you get these results or these things happen. But we also live now in a fallen world, so it doesn't always work that way. Not everything is aligned to God's plans anymore. And you have, throughout the Bible, not necessarily as Proverbs looks at it, but throughout the Bible, you have other books like Ecclesiastes, which will be our next series, by the way. You will find that things don't always work out, even if you are following God's design and God's plan. The righteous end up suffering in this world, right? And the unrighteous often get ahead in this world. Well, that's not the way it should be. Someday, this will all be worked out. But in the in-between time, we're in this time where we still want to learn and grow in wisdom from the book of Proverbs. But I can't give you, well, exactly, you know, it's always going to happen this way when you live this way. So the book of Proverbs is misquoted in that sense. It is not filled with hard, fast promises of God that you do this like the one, and I use this verse myself, Train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not wander from it. But many of you have had children who have wandered, right? At least for periods of time. It's a general rule. We can still say, Lord, this is what we want to see. Have your way with our children, our grandchildren, our family members. But you can't just say, Lord, you've got to do this, okay? And... Um, <clears throat> But it's wisdom literature, and we need, to, uh, we need to allow it to be what wisdom literature is. So the passage we're looking at today, actually, though, is one that I have misquoted myself. Okay? Most of the time, this passage today, we just quote the beginning of it and use it in a context that it wasn't intended. Um, often in the business world, it's used, or the political world that if you have any vision, you need to have a vision. And when you have a vision, you create a strategic plan for that vision. And when you have that good vision, compelling vision, and you broadcast it, then things come together. But it isn't really, this passage isn't really about vision, not the way that we're thinking of vision. So we're going to read the text and then get into it, OK? So it's very short today. And we're reading it, of all places, from the King James Version, because I think this is the one that is used as a misquote at times. Okay? But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, we're going to follow the outline we've done. Okay? So what Proverbs is not saying, what Proverbs is saying, and why it's important. What it's not saying. So I've heard pastors. Yeah, I'm one of them. And leaders explain this verse and share it in general, saying, um, you better have a vision. Come up with a vision that God wants you to have for your congregation, for your community, for your organization. Um, seek God's vision for it, um, whatever way. But you find a vision for it, and you need to then be the one who effectively communicates that vision. And when you are a type of leader that does all of this, 
um, then things will happen. But the way that we're using that word vision here is not the, what the word actually means. But I'm going to give you some examples, even from biblical, like from pastors that have used it. Bill Hybels, for example, wrote a book called Courageous Leadership. And in it, he says, um, we need to have a clear vision, as Proverbs 9, 29, 18 says, because people can't focus. If they can't focus, can't reach their goal, can't follow their dream, I've seen it with my own eyes. Without vision, people lose the vitality that makes them feel alive. Okay? Andy Stanley, who's a very um, successful pastor in Atlanta, says making your vision stick requires bold leadership. It will require you to develop a healthy intolerance for those things that have the potential to impede your progress. So the most important quality that a lot of things that I was taught often by many books I read. Have you ever read? Maybe you're not because I'm the pastor. You don't read these books on church leadership. You don't read these books on how to grow a successful congregation, yada, yada, yada. But I mean, I've read enough of them, and they all say, well, the leader is the most important thing. And I thought, well, I thought God might be. But OK, the leader is the most important thing. And you've got to have a compelling vision. And you've got to be clearly articulate. And the most important thing is that you've got to have the qualities of a CEO who can share a clear vision and a clear way of doing things. And someone, when they get that vision and they start uh, seeking that and they get everybody together in that vision, then great things happen in the church. And I'll tell you, over the last 2,000 years, there have been a lot of people within Christianity that have had their own visions. And sadly, there's a shrapnel of visions from things blowing up because they didn't turn out. A lot of damaged people, a lot of wounded, dis disillusioned Christians because of the visions that certain leaders or certain people have said is from God and everybody should follow and was not necessarily. Probably the best example is someone you've never heard of. <clears throat> His name was Montanus. And around the second century, so right after all the apostles had died, when all the first eyewitnesses of Jesus, when the New Testament was all written by the year 100, in the second century then, this guy Montanus in a place called Phrygia, which is where modern day Turkey is, um, he fell into a trance and began to prophesy under the influence of the Holy Spirit, as he said. He claimed that the voice of the Holy Spirit, he was the liar that the Holy Spirit plucked. And he had a vision and announced the fulfillment of the New Testament that was promised at Pentecost, that the imminent second coming of Jesus was going to happen right there in Papuza, which is the town that he did this at. And then two women also joined him, Maximilla and Prisca, and they left their husbands and started prophesying the same way. And they claimed they were speaking new words from God. They had the vision of what God was going to do and here, right here in Papuza, they had the vision and said, and this is how far it went. Montanus didn't say, thus saith the Lord. No, this is a uh, direct quote from him. I am neither an angel nor an envoy, but I, the Lord, the Father, have come. Whoa. Yeah, Jim Jones again. Large segment of Asia Minor fell for it. The early church struggled with this whole idea, and, um, and they ended up promoting Montanus specifically, and Montanism promoted uh, a strict asceticism where you could only eat certain foods, you could only live a certain way, you could only do a certain thing. What happened is there was no gospel in this word in the end. It was all rules that you need to live by in order to promote the second coming of Jesus and, by the way, give a lot of money so that we can build the new Jerusalem here in Papuza. It was a money-making operation, again. You can read about it. They had vision. They had vision. Proverbs doesn't say just come up with a vision, any vision. 
Too often people in the name of Christ have puffed up their own dreams and their own visions. And I have always had to look at the things that I've wanted and go like, oh, Lord, I don't know. And it's kind of scary to do, but you have to continue to offer everything up to the Lord and say, you know what? You don't need me. You don't need my organization, whatever it is. You don't need me at all, God. You can take rocks, as Jesus said, stones, and turn them into better children of Abraham than me. You don't need me. You don't need us. You don't need anything. You can do it all. We're just asking if you would use us. And always hold all our plans loosely, all our decisions under the contingency of God being in charge. But there have been so many people who have not necessarily done that. You can name the things in the United States that have happened from Heritage uh, USA theme park. Any of, of you remember that? To the city of faith. Montanus is still alive and well today. And they'll use this verse as, see, we've had a vision, and now everything will follow. Proverbs is not saying it. It's not saying your business needs a clear vision, although that's maybe a good idea. Clear missions are great, but the Bible is not a business textbook. It's not a management manual. It's God's word. And so I came to thrive 10 years ago with a lot of plans and a lot of ideas. And you probably had, some of you from the beginning, we all had them. And then um, God gets to do what he wants to do, right? Sometimes we get in the way. Um, but boy, you know, the thing that I needed to learn probably most than anything, and I still do, is humility about it all. Lord, you're in charge. I'm not. This is yours, not me. And it shouldn't be about my ego or my desires or my uh, quest for success or significance or any of that stuff. Maybe God is calling me to insignificance. Right? It's his plans. So I've become a bit more hesitant in strategic planning and envisioning the future. I often know, I mean, and I think... That fits in with more with the Bible. I'm not talking, don't plan anything and just whatever happens. I'm not talking any of that stuff. But I'm just saying, whenever we do make our plans, we have to realize they're my plans. You've heard, I think, from the poet, the best laid plans of mice and men, right? Well, I think biblically you can find that, especially in the book of James. He says this, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, your boast you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. How much vision casting is boasting? It's a good question to think about. So what is Proverbs telling us? Maybe I need to read this in a couple of different translations for you to understand uh, what's really going on with that word for vision, etc. First of all, in um, let's try the New International Version, NIV, <clears throat> where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. And here the ESV, English Standard Version, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law, the Torah. Now, this is historically exactly what happened in Israel. You know, from Israel's inception on, they all had their plans. They all wanted to do it their way. And through the golden years of the United Kingdom under David and Solomon, 
to the divided kingdom in their final fall and exile into Babylon and then return. And even when they returned, if you read the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, often people think those are great leadership manuals, but you actually, when you read the text and see what's really going on, they are about leadership failures because what Nehemiah tried to do, he starts yelling at the people at the end of his section. And Ezra too starts putting in more rules and laws to try to make things happen and they don't. Human leadership often fails, and the Bible is filled with that again and again. You see, maybe at the greatest inception of God's instruction, we see the people not receiving God's instruction, his vision of reality, and instead casting off all restraints. When Moses received God's revelation on Mount Sinai, God had already spoken verbally the Ten Commandments, According to the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, he spoke those to all the people to hear them. Moses goes up for 40 days on the mountain, and what do the people do? They cast off those words below the mountain. This is what it says in Exodus 32. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and go up to indulge in revelry. They, without the vision of God, that is God's revealed word that he had spoken, the people cast off restraint and chaos ensued. If you read the book of Judges, it's just a total devolution. It's just a downward spiral until everything falls apart. They cast off restraint. The prophet Hosea speaks about the northern kingdom of Israel this way. He says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. And it's not just any knowledge. It's the intimate knowing of God, knowing him relationally, trusting him. So the Word vision in this passage from Proverbs 29 is the Hebrew word chazon, and it means vision, but it's really related to the Hebrew word chose, which is another word for prophet or seer, and it's really saying one who has encountered God who has a vision of who God is and what he has seen. A prophet is someone who has actually had God's word come to him in a personal and counter way and has to speak about it. I like what Abraham Heschel says about the prophetic visions that the prophets had that were to be followed. He writes this, the prophets had no theory or idea of God. What they had was an understanding. Their God understanding was not the result of a theoretical inquiry, of a groping in the midst of alternatives about the being and attributes of God. To the prophets, God was overwhelmingly real and shatteringly present. They never spoke of him as from a distance. They lived as witnesses struck by the words of God rather than as explorers engaged in an effort to ascertain the nature of God. Their utterances were the unloading of a burden rather than glimpses obtained in the fog of groping. Without a prophetic vision, without God's word encountering us, without God coming to us through the prophets, through his word, we're just going to go in all different directions. Everything's going to be a mess. Hmm. Do you think that's going on now? Anything happened the last couple weeks since we've been gone? (laughs) Nothing interesting? No. Yeah, it's funny. I was talking to Victor. He's in um, uh, the class I'm teaching this fall, uh, Religion and Politics in America at FGCU. What a time to be teaching that, right? And I said, you know what? I got everything done for this class a month ago before vacation. Everything's up. Everything's ready. And now I'm going to have to, oh, I've got to take that out and put this in. It's going to be like, it's going to be on the fly um, this year. Everything keeps shifting. Now we're doing the historical part. So we're going to go back to the founding of America and all that stuff. But there's so much of the contemporary stuff. It's like, OK, what's, what's happening now? <laughs> it's like we're living in it. Um, without God's prophetic vision, without his word, 
without God showing up in your life or mine, I know what happens to me. I just do my own thing, go in my own direction, you know, like how Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Yeah. So, this is a very humbling word, actually, from the book of Proverbs, I think. But I think it's better to understand it than a business formula or some, um, some formula that if a uh, prosperity gospel kind of formula, if I have a vision for this and God, you know, and then I get a hundred million dollars to build it, they will come. So I think this is better because we have God's vision fulfilled. This is how Second Peter talks about it. Peter was writing, one of the apostles himself, who had, boy, did he have ideas and visions of what should happen. Oh, no, no, Lord, you're not going to do that. And Jesus had to turn to him and say, get behind me, Satan. I mean, that's how, that's how uh, his visions uh, were in relation to God's vision and purpose. So Peter writes this in his second letter, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he's saying, I didn't come up with this stuff. I didn't make this up. I didn't have a visioning retreat where I tried to figure out what God wanted. No, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. This was the Mount of Transfiguration, which happens in uh, the Gospels, uh, the Synoptic Gospels, where he is speaking with both Moses and Elijah, in a sense the Torah, the law, and the prophets, right? And they both talk to him. And in the book of the Gospel of Luke, it says, what were they discussing? But his deliverance that would occur in Jerusalem. And the word for deliverance there in the Greek is exodon, his exodus. The fact that he was going to fulfill what was done. The exodus, the freedom that Israel gained from Egypt was a foreshadowing of the freedom that God would give to all his people through what Jesus would do through his death and resurrection. And Elijah as well. They were talking about what God was going to bring about through Jesus. And we have this prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know, if you ever hear something from me that I say, I had a revelation of the Lord and I speak something new, that is not recorded in the scriptures, that doesn't seem quite there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Consider it heresy. Heresy, I know it sounds a terrible word. We hardly ever use it. It means to veer off. It means to go away in a different direction. Watch out. If somebody comes up with any vision, <laughs> that's something new. You know, the last, not saying new application, but a new word, as if God needs to add any more words than the word Jesus himself. True prophets don't make stuff up. They don't also inflate themselves. And I think that's one of the tests as well as who's being glorified with this? Who is being exalted with this? Who is being elevated with this? Like I said, at uh, different times, Timothy Keller says there's only one real subtext to any message that should be coming across, and it should be about Jesus and how great he is. It should never be about how great the preacher is, nor how great the church is. We can celebrate what God has done for us at Thrive, but it's all about Jesus 
and it's always centered on him. And so watch out if you find anybody to, quote, prophesize or is giving you a vision that actually is just a great way to build up their ego. You will notice none of the prophets, as Abraham Heschel said it, wanted to be one. Do you understand? Nobody, was rec nobody said, hey, can I volunteer for this? No. Um, what you find in the Old Testament, for instance, is that God showed up to people from the technicolor vision of God's throne for Ezekiel to Isaiah's shocking encounter at the temple where he is stunned and silenced and thinks he's going to die. Nobody wants to be a prophet and see God's vision that way, and yet it is so necessary for us to have it, to have the fullness of God in a way that doesn't kill us. And all the prophets thought they were going to die, and they only spoke out of, and often the word to speak for God was a burden. It was a burden. You can see Jeremiah especially talking about how he just wanted to get wiggle out some way to get away, but he couldn't, and it was almost like if he tried to stop, it was a burning in his own bones, he said. It was just like a fire in his bones. He had to speak. But God gives us, you and me, not some, okay, here are the steps that we have to do in order to get. Here's the vision, and if we all get together and do it, this is going to happen. He gives us the vision the one vision that we all need. Hebrews states it this way. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of majesty. I'm going to paraphrase, and I don't think it's a misquote. Without the vision of Jesus Christ, the people perish. I think that's biblical. We're just going to go our own way. We do our own thing. You can do a God thing and be off base. Only as you encounter the living Lord Jesus Christ. As he comes to you, even as he is coming to you this morning in his word, he promises to be present wherever his word, his Holy Spirit is present here today. And it's only as I am encountering God through his word, that's where I find eternal life. The vision that saves is one who instead of killing off those who see the vision, like Isaiah thought he was going to die, Ezekiel wasn't sure about it, Jeremiah, all of the prophets were like, oh my gosh, we can't encounter the living God. The children of Israel were scared of God's presence. Moses went up. He had to have a veil over his face after he saw God. I mean, it was just, you see, and it says in the Bible, if anyone would see the fullness of God, they're going to be dead. We have a God who comes in the fullness of, in human form, in such a way that we don't die, but he does. And he does it so that we can have the vision of who you are in relation to God. That you are loved, you are forgiven, you are reconciled, you are his very precious. Uh, you, you have every promise of God. That's the certainty I can give you today. And why is it better? You don't have to figure out a vision. I don't have to figure out a vision. It's not up to you to have enough chutzpah to envision it, to communicate it clearly to everybody so that they get it. Uh, you don't have to rally the troops. You don't have to uh, whip up enough sentiment or faith. There's no, none, none of that. God gives you his vision of the future in Jesus Christ. Your future is in him. He is your future. You have a certain and sure future. I don't care. The last three weeks have been kind of crazy, nationally, internationally maybe. The next few months may be crazy. Who knows, right? Um, we're living in a very tumultuous, divisive time. Um, 
doesn't change anything about the vision that God has for you or Jesus Christ or what he has for you. Your future is secure. He's going to be with you. Um, and you get to see in the vision of who Jesus is the cross that you deserved, but he hung on. And the grave you earned, but he was entombed in. And a Savior who is raised from the dead, who offers to you that resurrection as yours. Without the vision of Jesus Christ, people will perish. That I get. Why would anyone want to run away and cast off restraints to go in a different direction from that? Why would anyone want to follow anyone else? Blessed is the one who heeds this instruction from God. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for um, your goodness and grace in our lives. Um, Lord, you know how easy it is that we just want to come up with things and then come up with reasons and even put your name as a rubber stamp on why this happened or that happened or what we want. But it's really often, um, I've seen it in myself too often for this place even, it's just my desires um, wrapped up in spiritual terms. Forgive us for those things, Lord. Forgive us for the ways that we have wandered like sheep from you. Forgive us for what we have uh, sought after other things, just like the children of Israel, Lord, that we've gone after not a golden calf necessarily, but money, power, romance, whatever it is, Lord, we think it's going to be the answer when you are the ultimate, Lord Jesus. Forgive us for any way that we have deceived ourselves because we're not deceiving you when we sin, Lord. We're not deceiving you when we stray. We're not deceiving you with our words or deeds. We only deceive ourselves, Lord, and the truth is not in us. But as we are now confessing our sins to you, Lord, you are faithful and just. You forgive us all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for that. We lift up to you, Lord, uh, the future for Thrive. Lord, we're, after 10 years, you've been with us, and we've, uh, you've brought us through, like I said, many things, Lord, and many uh, failed attempts at trying to figure things out on our own, and yet you still are faithful and given us promise after promise, Lord, and we thank you for that. I know, Lord, for some of us, we're in the midst of things when we thought, oh, I thought this was it, and it wasn't now, and we're wondering what the next step is. Lord, we pray. I just pray that you would come, Jesus, um, through your word to be present with your promises for each one here this day, to share your love and the vision you have for them, the future you have for them, Lord, your promises that you have for us, Lord, in this turbulent time. We do pray for our nation. We pray, O oh Lord, for um, all the leaders as well as, oh Lord, uh, we just pray your will is done, no one else's. We don't need anyone else's will done, Lord. There's too many people vying for that, competing for that. We see what's happening in this world as a result of the power struggles and the violence that we will try to bring our will done, Lord. Forgive us for those things. Move us so that we see and delight in your will and walk in your ways and seek your kingdom above all things, Lord God. We pray that you'd prepare our hearts uh, and minds uh, and uh, selves, Lord, all that we are to receive uh, you this morning um, in the Lord's Supper, to, to commune with you and you with us. Um, bless our tithes and offerings that we will offer to you, Lord, for your kingdom's purpose. And may your will be done here through us, not because you have to, Lord, but because you'd want to. You don't need us but you still call us, Lord, by your grace, and we thank you for that. We're privileged and honored that you would so use us, and we pray that you would work through us in Southwest Florida. We pray that your kingdom would come among us and through us to others. All this we lift up to you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.